Today's symposium, structured in two parts, reflects this multifaceted fascination. In the first part of the symposium, we're focusing on the exhibition itself and its programs. And we'll have a presentation from the curator of the exhibition, Juan Insua, and the producer of this edition of the exhibition, Dimitris Kontopoulos. Genevieve Galliano will give us insights into the historical artifacts in the exhibition that show how Mars was once seen as a god in ancient times. And to culminate part one, Rachel Wong will take us on a voyage into the realms of science fiction, introducing the cinema program In Search of Tomorrow that runs alongside the exhibition. At 4 p.m., we transition into our second segment where we pivot our focus to the future, a future where Mars is not just a distant dream, but an ever-present reality. We're deeply honored to have Dr. Masaki Fujimoto with us today from the Japanese space agency, JAXA. He will introduce JAXA's Martian Moon's explore, exploration mission, MM2, which will shed light on Japan's ambitious plan to go to the Martian moon Phobos. We'll then hear from one of the few artists anywhere in the world who's trained as an astronaut, Michael Najjar, and we'll learn about his recent trip to SpaceX's spaceport, Starbase, and what he learned there. And then we'll return to our region, Southeast Asia, and have three presentations from pioneering space scientists and artists from this region. The founder of the Indonesia Space Sciences Society, Vince Christ, will introduce us to Southeast Asia's first Mars Analog Initiative, an extraordinary venture at the crossroads of art and science. Dr. Roy Ang from the Genome Institute of Singapore will tell us what he knows about growing crops on Mars, delving into the practical challenges and innovation required for sustaining life on the red planet. And finally, the founder of Singapore's space faculty, Lynette Tan, will share her perspectives on space as a source of inspiration and innovation. The development of Mars the Red Mirror has been a long and rewarding process, and I'd like to thank some of the people who made it happen. Firstly, and most importantly, our partners, CCCB, and in particular, their director, Judith Carrera, and the curator of the exhibition, Juan Insua. Thank you for your partnership on this project and for being here today. You're going to be hearing from Judith shortly, and Juan will give a presentation about the exhibition uh, in just a few minutes. I'd also like to acknowledge my team at Art Science Museum, who've worked so hard on the exhibition and its attendant programs. I'm grateful to Adrian George, Chelsea Chai, and Joshua Lau from our exhibitions department, and especially our senior producer, Demetrius. I'd also like to thank Jerome Chi and Rachel Wong for curating the ambitious science fiction film program that runs alongside the exhibition and to Zen and Jia Ying for developing and producing today's symposium. Mars the Red Mirror invites visitors to contemplate our past, present, and future in the cosmos at a time where the exploration of Mars is more relevant than ever. Space agencies around the world, including JAXA, who are with us today, are planning new missions to Mars and its moons. Private space companies, such as SpaceX, who our speaker Michael Najjar was with recently, are actively planning manned missions to Mars. Within our lifetime, it is conceivable that people may walk on Mars, marking the moment where humanity becomes a multi-planetary species. And yet, with all this planning underway by scientists and engineers, we can't help wonder if this urge to travel to Mars might be overshadowing the issues that we have on our own planet, beset as it is with multiple environmental challenges. Those are some of the questions that we'll be exploring today. So let us embark on a journey to Mars together, a journey that promises to expand our horizons and challenge our understanding of what it means to be part of this universe. Thank you for being here today and for your willingness to explore the unknown 
Together, let's imagine humanity's future as we set our sights on the mysteries and wonders of Mars. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. And it's my absolute pleasure welcoming Director of CCCV, Judith Carrera, for her remarks. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the CCCB, but also to thank Honor, Adrian, Dimitris, and the incredible team at the Art Science Museum. It's been a huge pleasure to work with you over these past months. And we're delighted uh, with the, the result of the exhibition. We think it's an extraordinary new adaptation of the exhibition that we presented at the CCCB in Barcelona back in 2021. As Honor already mentioned, this exhibition is a cultural history of Mars at a time of the exploration and new discoveries of the Red Planet we thought it was interesting to give a historical perspective of, of the fascination in Earth about this red planet from the ancient times where uh, Mars was identified with the god of war, but also the god of agriculture, which was basically um, the, the god of life, no? the, the, go, the god that gave also birth to life. So this, is, this contradiction between being the god of war and the god of life, that. Uh, gave birth to the March, the month of March, the spring, uh, the life, is part of one of the contradictions that this um, an ambivalence of our relationship with, with the red planet that this exhibition uh, shows. Uh, today, this, as, as I said, this is a journey between uh, from the ancient times to the present when Mars is a kind of a mirror, uh, no, the red mirror of uh, some of the concerns that we currently have uh, in the Earth, uh, in particular the climate change uh, challenges that we're currently facing. Um, what is interesting about the exhibition also is that it shows that uh, for one, more than one century uh, in Earth, we were fascinated and feared the attacks from Mars uh, from Mars to the Earth, no, we're kind of feeding the attacks of extraterrestrials into the into our planet. And today's uh, it really goes into the other the other direction. Not that today the, the direction is from the Earth to Mars. One of the things that at the CCB we wanted to uh, face with this exhibition is the importance of the bridge, of building bridges between science uh, and the arts and the, and the humanities. Uh, we think that in times of scientific and technological uh, revolution, it's very important to offer a critical perspective, a critical perspective that comes not only from scientists and from, from the technological side, but also from artists, uh, cultural um, actors, and also the, the role of the humanities in, in having this critical uh, perspective of uh, revolutions that really have an, a, a huge impact in our, in our lives. So that's the role of a museum like ours and the museum of and here. I think this, this importance of um, building these bridges between uh, uh, arts and the, and the sciences. We also think that humanities, the arts, and, and culture in general provide the, the necessary imagination uh, for a different future, a different future in, in these times of dark, uh, uh, dark future that uh, climate change is, is presenting us. Uh, I think this exhibition at the end of the day offers some hope um, in these dystopian times, some hope that life can be uh, uh, born in an extinct uh, territory like in Mars. Uh, no, we're discovering that, that in Mars uh, there was a, an extinction already, but then life could be, we're seeing that life can, can, uh, can also be uh, born there. So I think that Mars, among many other things, shows us that uh, life can be born uh, in, in a very um, degraded uh, landscape. So with this uh, optimistic note, I would like to end and thank you ev everyone for being here, uh, also the artists and the collaborators of the exhibition. Thank you very much. Um, curator of Mars, the Red Mirror, Juan Insoa. <laughs> Sorry, just let me get introduction to Juan first. Um, so Juan is delivering our first presentation of the program. Um, and by way of introduction, um, Juan is a curator. He's also a promoter of research and innovation in the field of culture. And he was the director of CCCB Lab um, up until 2021. Exhibitions he conceived and curated included Cities and Writers, James Joyce's Dublin, The Lisbon's of Pessoa, The City of K. Franz Kafka in Prague, 
Prague, um, Borges in Buenos Aires, and Leading Lights of the 20th Century. Um, Juan received the FAD Medal in 2008 for his contributions to improve the environment and people's lives through design and creativity. And he's currently working on a project about the power of wonder. Um, and uh, Juan will introduce the conceptual and theoretical framework of Mars the Red Mirror, and he will speak to the importance of the Red Planet and what it reveals as a mirror of humanity. And we're so thrilled to welcome Juan for the first talk of the program. Well, thank you very much for your invitation. I'm real, uh, very happy with the work of uh, the team during more one year to Dimitris, Joshua, Chelsea. Uh, it's a wonderful experience for me. And thank you, of course, of honor. And thank you for Judith, because he um, um, asked me if I want to do an exhibition about Mars. And I insisted, do you really want an exhibition about Mars? Yeah. And then, uh, well, I work during, alone, during nine months with the script and the conception of the exhibition, uh, because my conception of exhibition is, uh, is inverted in the sense that I work, imagine, with became light, space, and the visual, and then I came to the central point that is the real exhibition material, because I think the exhibitions, and in general, a work of art, the principle is about um, amazement and emotion, because are the two component, essential component of art, and the intellectual levels come after. Usually, in the exhibitions are, well, look, all what the curator knows about this idea. And for me, the important is the opposite, is the people can free, comfortable, in a friendly space, in atmosphere, and to have one thing that is a historical thing of art, that is the suspension of disbelief, the suspension of disbelief. And then uh, is. For me, the conception is, is about more aesthetical and approach to different levels of um, knowledge. Well, the, the, the first thing that I say to uh, have a, a, a difference, oh, we'll see, this is, yes, okay, is um, to situate into the, to, in English, there is a very interesting uh, game between history, that is about dates, and story is about fiction. But I think, I personally think, that uh, history or facts and fiction are very related. It's the same with the beginning of the philosophy. Usually the people said that uh, the born of philosophy is where well, logos has separated from the mythos. No, I think logos and mythos are always unified. And then uh, this is, we have one big history that is uh, that the consensus of the cosmological um, cosmovision of our day that our universe begin in the Big Bang, then there is a lot of time and the solar system was created. At the same time, uh, Mars and uh, the Earth was uh, created. And then Mars and Earth was twin planet from the beginning of this Greek history. And I think it's important to learn the story of universe and the story of Mars in, 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 at, at the same uh, time. Then, um, 
But to do the exhibition, we must to have some quotes. Uh, Timothy Morton said that we live in a present of 12,000 years and from the uh, beginning of agriculture to our days. And they, this is the segment that we use. That in the sense of deep time, deep time, that is a, a concept that um, in general the people is difficult to us to understand. We are a new species. We are relative new. And our existence in the hearth is very short in relation with the time of the universe, the birth of life in earth, etc. We are a new space. We are learning. We are possibly at the end of the childhood. And this is a special moment for us because we have a real perspective of our history and the different levels of knowledge through the eras. Uh, Martian and Asian cultures is the, the first great section and uh, be, be, begins with in, in Babylonia, in Mesopotamia, with Nergal. Nergal is the Babylonian Mars, was a god of wars, uh, a demon, because it was a, a, a god of infra world. But some experts said that he was uh, a god of um, a telluric god. Then, uh, if we go to the system of Egyptian, it's more complex. I, I have no time to explain that because it's, it's a different conception. In the Greek um, culture, Mars was a minor god. If you remember, or you say, the, um, um, Homer said that um, Mars was, uh, well, uh, uh, a god of a lot of problems. And when we came to Rome, uh, that uh, the artist Greek became Mars, he was a relevant god. He was a god of uh, a lord of the armies, but to the uh, protector of crops, the beginning of the spring, the beginning because it's March, Mars, the beginning of this, the spring. And then for me, this is very important, this to in, in one part, we can say, like, say you had some kind of contradiction, but are really the two relevant forces that create our, our humanity, war and agriculture. And the god of war is the god of the, a terri territorial god who, who defends nation and different kind of uh, empires from others. And uh, agriculture is our forces. And uh, some people think that we are at the final of the agriculture period. And the climate change is a result of our bad managing of this planet. Because one of the sections of the exhibition talk about that. We are bad managers of our planet. It's important to think that in this century is the first time that in, in a general point of view, we are understanding that we are not the center of anything. We are not the center of anything. We are one of the different intelligence that are here in the earth and in the universe. Now we are talking about the, there is a lot of bibliography about plants, the intelligence of plants, the intelligence of animals, and we have a new uh, competition with artificial intelligence. Then we are in, in, in the sense of ontological and epistemological way in the same, in the same range of all the things. But still, we feel that we are in the top of the trophic chain, and we are the predators. That's our real problem. And the paradox, the paradox of that, is that we have all this vision. We, we began to understand we are part of a whole entire uh, planet full of life and different kind of, 
of uh, existence. And really, in, in this moment, we need to have, uh, at the same time, we are becoming, in the new space race, a multiplanetary species. And this is a terrible paradox, because, like say, uh, Carl Sagan, if we are bad manager of this planet, why we need to go to other planets? And in this end, this is a very controversial opinions, but I think, I, I feel that um, the best is uh, to think in, in a biocentric way, it is to respect life in all the solar system and to think life in really for me, the, the rational is to think that the universe was created for life. It's impossible to think we are alone. It's not rational. It's not rational. We are alone. We have no proof of alien intelligence. It's a stupid question, but it's a general common sense that there is, we are alone in the universe. It's impossible that we are alone in this marvelous universe, lot of galaxies of all kinds, exoplanets, etc. Well, I'm sorry, I think I, well. Uh, this is the second section, science and fiction of the rare planet, because all, all the first go to the, the end of, of, of the second, uh, of, um, of the 19th century. And this is a, a very special moment about our archaeology of consciousness, because we think that the final of the 19th century at the beginning of, of uh, the last century are under the ideal of reason, progress, and uh, science. No, this is a moment that when uh, the red planet became uh, like a red sun around all the trends of that moment goes, engineers, inventors, astronomers, uh, mediums, uh, for example, the two principal inventors that uh, uh, like Edison, that he made the, the first movie about Mars, or uh, Nikola Tesla, that he invented the telescope and, and he uh, say that he has receiving signal from Mars. And then uh, there is uh, another curious issue that is a lot of mediums. The principal is possible is Helen Smith, that is a muse for surrealist, that he is uh, receiving, canalizing message from Mars, an alphabet, landscape, etc. And uh, what I came to say is that we never be, like Bruno Latour said, moderns. Because we are still magical thinking, we are proto-science, we have pseudo-science, we have religion thinking, we have uh, technological thinking, but all that strata of consciousness are with us now, and we have the perspective to integrate all in this culture. For example, the, in, in general, the media say uh, culture, science, no, all is culture. All, all we, uh, the men and women do is culture. And science is uh, one of the best tools for uh, a changing vision of the universe. And I say that is a history and story because we are now into the narrative of the Big Bang. But we don't know if in the next years don't change, don't change. And it's possible to change because science is talking about multiverse and different kind of, of um, objects. We know that 80% of the universe is dark matter and dark energy. And in that sense, we need a, a school of humility, a school of humility, wonder, humility, and focus because we have another real problem. And, and the third section, finally, Mars in the Anthropocene, is the sense of this exhibition. But when you did ask me to do a, an exhibition about Mars, the first I, I think is, 
Well, it's important to do an exhibition that is really linked with our present, with our present, with our present. We have in a world that are in interconnected crises, financial crisis, war, climate change, emergence, we are becoming an interplanetary species. And we are in that uh, special moment for, for one side, a terrible, because we recognize, recognize that we are bad managers of the planet, bad managers of the planet. And on the other side, we have, we can talk about all this. And this is like a, a miraculous. And then uh, the other thing is uh, what say about we are alone. Carl Sagan, that was a, a, a rational and sceptic mind, said, if we really are alone, the universe is a terrible waste of space. <laughs> because it's impossible that we are alone. And I um, invited you to change your mind. And she said, no, we are not alone. We are two aliens. The Martians are us. And I think one of the principal message of, of the exhibition that Law will remember is that uh, if we don't stop climate change, we became like Mars. Because Mars is the result of a millenary climate change. He, he was losing his atmosphere, he's the red planet, but we, we have the same kind of land cap of in, in Mars. And I think the, the best uh, finally to, because I am 20 minutes, I'm more than 20 minutes, no? It's okay? No. And, and finally, I, I want to synthesize my uh, chaotic talk. <laughs> I think the final consideration is the, the, the exhibition is the cultural history of Mars for 12,000 years, uh, linked to the two, uh, the two decisive forces of uh, uh, our civilization, agriculture and war. It's um, to understanding the different strat of consciousness that is um, the archaeology of our conscience. We allow us to discover the Anthropocene. We need to adapt to uh, new cosmic and temporal scales at the same time to begin uh, to admit, uh, we say um, one moment, that uh, we must to understand the intelligence of plants, the intelligence of uh, animals, the the challenge of uh, artificial intelligence. And I, I think it's necessary uh, a great global and local debate about what uh, is the significance to become a multiplanetary species, which is there are no laws. We have no contract about that. It's the same with, the, we have a, a social contract, but we never have a natural contract. We have a never a natural contract with the nature. And remember that Mars is the great geopolitical objective of the new space race and the new space economy. And then it's impossible to stop that. We go to Mars. We go to Mars. Of course, in 20th it's possible, Elon Musk said, in the 30th or during the, the next decades. And finally, uh, yes, is that the, I think uh, this is an exhibition about what we are. The subject is Mars, because Mars uh, is um, a special planet that is planet, God, archetypical, uh, and have this different, different kind of, of uh, uh, comprehension. And um, yes, I think it's, it's, it's a great adventure. For me, it was a, a special experience and always was, uh, um, in this kind of complex project, 
and great learning. And I insist, I really am very happy and in happy in, in, in the sense of profound heart uh, to all the team and to um, this museum for uh, this exhibition. For me, it was, uh, was uh, always with mine. I'm very real, very happy, and you are all wonderful people. Um, thank you, Juan. That's a lot to unpack, um, perhaps in the second panel when we get to Q&A with the rest of the speakers. Um, the exhibition presented in our space at ArtScience Museum is an adaptation of the one first staged at CCCB two years ago, and is augmented in its current iteration with the curatorial contributions of our exhibitions team. And my exhibition's colleague, um, senior producer, Dimitris Gontopoulos, um, will illustrate the evolved iteration of the exhibition and how it also turns its lens to Asia. Dimitris, please. All right. Um, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, let's start. Okay, so um, I will be talking about how we adapted Juan's exhibition to our spaces and to our context as an art science museum in Asia. Uh, but first, a few things about me. Um, great. So I am Greek. Uh, this means that uh, Aris, uh, the Greek original of Mars, uh, was a big part of our culture and my childhood reading mythological stories. Uh, the 12 gods of Olympus were always there, and Aris was one of them. So I grew up with uh, Aris in a sense. Uh, then I studied physics and astronomy, uh, and more specifically, the formation of, of planets around distant stars. So I have always been interested in planets as um, uh, perhaps uh, habitats for life uh, and uh, what they might mean uh, for the universe as Juan explained that uh, it, the universe might be a whole of empty space if there is no life uh, anywhere else. And finally, I'm, pa I'm passionate about the investigation of uh, art and science. Um, and uh, Mars has been an object of fascination for both uh, artists and scientists so, uh, throughout history. Um, so I could not have asked for a better project to be involved in, and that's why I want to, ask, to thank uh, Judith, who had the idea, Juan, who made the exhibition, and then Honor and Adrian, who assigned this uh, project to me. Uh, I could not have asked for anything better, and I, it has been a pleasure working uh, with Juan for the last uh, one year and getting direction from uh, Honor and Adrian to put us in the right track to deliver the exhibition. Um, and Chelsea, thank you so much for all your hard work. I know it was uh, uh, a lot, but very interesting, I hope. Right, so um, to bring the uh, exhibition to Art Science Museum, um, we used perhaps this axis uh, to guide us as to what we wanted to do here. Um, then, it, as I said, it was very important for us to uh, add Asian stories, uh, both regional, uh, both from Singapore and regional, uh, and across many different countries. Um, we wanted to work with uh, partners here in Singapore, and I think we were able to do that. Um, and uh, as well, we also wanted to work with uh, uh, contemporary artists, uh, not limiting ourselves to Asia, but from all around the world. Uh, and finally, uh, we, uh, it was a, a long process trying to uh, reapproach all the original lenders of the exhibition to see who is interested to participate again, uh, or what is possible and what is not. And that is why we had to go uh, to them again, one by one, to see who could uh, join us uh, and, who, and then find replacements for those who couldn't. So we ended up with um, uh, a long list of new uh, collaborators in uh, the exhibition both contemporary artists, as uh, I mentioned, from all around the world, and then from here in Singapore, uh, our friends at the Asian Civilization Museum, the Heritage Conservation Center, then we have uh, Zaksa as well, thank you, for, uh, Dr. Fujimoto, for being here today, um, Space Faculty, the Genome Institute of Singapore, and even our friends at uh, the Independent uh, Theater, uh, the Projector. Right, so, uh, 
with my presentation, I would like to take you from um, the beginning to the end of the exhibition to show you uh, the changes that we have made and why we made them. Um, and I would also like to, s to add one more thing, that uh, the exhibition is a journey through time, from ancient times to the present day, um, where in the beginning, Mars or Aris or Nergal were something, uh, were figures in mythology. And uh, towards the end of the exhibition, uh, to the present day, we will see that we are about to go to Mars with uh, technology being developed uh, at SpaceX and other companies or uh, national um, aerospace and uh, um, space exploration agencies. Um, so something that was a myth, something that was imagination, now is becoming reality. Um, I'm coming from a science background, so this to me uh, is very romantic in a sense that uh, thanks to science and technology, we have been able to turn something that's a myth to actually going to Mars. Maybe the next 10, 20, or 30 years, we will go to Mars after 5,000 years of imagining Mars. And that, to me, is uh, something that uh, has been, uh, I have been thinking since the beginning of this project. And uh, speaking about time, uh, one of the first addition we made to the exhibition uh, was the moment from Katie Patterson. Um, the, this uh, hand, uh, this uh, um, hourglass uh, contains pulverized material that has come from space, uh, from the moon, or from Mars, uh, and it counts 15 minutes. Uh, in a way, it's a timekeeping device at the beginning of the exhibition uh, that is a journey through time. Um, in this presentation, I will go through some of the content that uh, our artists or collaborators will uh, go through in their presentation as well. I will just do the brief overview so you know what's coming and they will go into detail in their presentations. Uh, and one such example is uh, some new loans that we had to go uh, after. Um, uh, from the Museum of uh, Fine Arts in Lyon, and Genevieve will tell us more about them later. Uh, but this is one example of uh, some items that we could not get from the original exhibition, uh, or we had to do a mix of old and new to go after new lenders. Um, and uh, thanks to my colleague who found, uh, who approached the, the uh, museum in Lyon. Um, right, so one of the key uh, sections we added in the exhibition was Mars in Asian cultures. Um, my colleague Chelsea, who will be our moderator later, uh, went on a journey of six months studying and researching uh, about the depiction of Mars uh, all across Asia and uh, all across time. Uh, we reached out to museums and curators all around the world who could give us hints uh, about where we could find Mars uh, in Asian paintings or in Asian artifacts we quickly realized that uh, this is a very niche subject and uh, not a lot of people knew where we could find Mars, uh, but thanks to Chelsea Research, uh, we were able to put together this corner uh, that uh, consists of uh, uh, artifacts and paintings and scrolls from Sri Lanka, India, uh, China, and Japan. Uh, we see Mars being depicted uh, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, and in Taoism in different forms. Um, I have picked up two examples here um, from uh, China and Japan where we see uh, Mars being depicted with other celestial bodies or with, uh, together with uh, Buddha. And I'm going to show you exactly where uh, because it's a little bit difficult to see, but you can go later in the galleries and perhaps you can uh, take a closer look. Um, you will see that Mars here is uh, red in both these occasions and he is holding, he has mul multiple hands and he is holding multiple weapons. Uh, you can keep this in mind and then return to the galleries and try to find him in the rest of the paintings as well. Um, there were more abstract depictions of uh, Mars as well, uh, like this lintel from Indonesia, where um, we saw in the image I saw very quickly from the Museum of Lyon, um, Mars or Aris is depicted as alone uh, individually, but we found that in many Asian depictions, Mars uh, has been presented as part of a group. And this is what we see here. Mars is in the bottom row together with uh, the n uh, nine planetary deities. Um, another example from uh, Sri Lanka here. 
Um, so uh, I'm not sure if there's anybody more expert than Chelsea in the world about Mars in Asian cultures at the moment, uh, because it was, uh, and I would say this was one of the most fascinating things we did for the exhibition. Uh, so, and we are very proud for creating this new corner. Um, next up, we go, we go back to astronomy. Uh, and here as well, we tried to do research uh, into Asian astronomers. Here, this section uh, is talking about uh, the heliocentric model or how um, we, more astronomers, figured out that the sun is at the center of the solar system, uh, while previously uh, the, the belief was that the Earth was at the center of the solar system. So apart from the many European astronomers who contributed to, with observations to this theory, uh, we identified two um, uh, astronomers uh, from the Middle East and from India, um, Nasir al din and uh, Nikalatha Sumayadzi, uh, who both of them, they made um, observations and uh, they criticized the previously believed model of the, cent the Earth being at the center of uh, the solar system. Um, of course, this is not the achievement of uh, one or two individuals. This has been an evolution in uh, astronomy for hundreds or thousands of years. Uh, and we see how many people, uh, how many different people and astronomers all around the world put their little stone uh, to the right direction so we can figure out where we are in uh, the universe. Um, next up, we, uh, apart from uh, deep research uh, and uh, finding uh, super interesting facts about uh, uh, Mars in Asian cultures or the heliocentric model, we uh, decided to be a little bit more playful with uh, the design of the exhibition and uh, bring some stories to life. Um, here in uh, the second section of the exhibition, the science and fiction of the Red Planet, uh, the, one of the key stories that we identified was the broadcast of the War of the Worlds. Uh, in around 1935, uh, there was this um, reading of uh, the book War of Worlds from H.G. Uh, uh, Wells, um, and uh, people in their homes, like what we have recreated here with this living room, they actually thought that aliens were invading, because this is the story of the book. Uh, it's a book about uh, an, a Martian invasion. So this spread panic uh, to the listeners. and. Uh, uh, in, in, in the frames above the living room, we have uh, the original drawings from one of the first uh, illustrations of the book. Right, moving on to Mars becoming part of uh, popular culture. Uh, we are very proud. Uh, thank you, Venza. <laughs> uh, we, uh, our friend Venza Christ from uh, Indonesia was kind enough to uh, lend us uh, his collection of uh, Indonesian comics. Uh, there's a more than 60, uh, spanning decades. Um, uh, and they are comics that have both Western characters in stories about Mars or original Indonesian characters in original stories that center around Mars. Uh, Venza has uh, his own uh, museum with collectibles uh, and uh, about space and Mars in Indonesia. Uh, and I'm sure he will talk to us later during the day about that. Um, we also added a little a selection of Japanese manga. Uh, there were so many of them with many varied stories. So here we wanted to show that this fascination with Mars uh, was not limited to one specific geographical location, but it spread uh, in Asia and in Southeast Asia as well. Uh, then one, I really, I won't really want to talk about this uh, because I'm a huge fan of the projector. It's one of my favorite places in Singapore. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's an old style cinema uh, and we worked with them to get chairs, uh, authentic cinema chairs that we re upholstered for the exhibition. Um, because in this section, we have a lot of B movies from the 50s and 60s. Uh, probably Rachel will tell us more about that. So we wanted to transport people back in that time and give them an authentic feeling that they're uh, maybe 50 years ago uh, in a cinema of that time. So big thank you to the projector for working with us uh, to make this uh, possible. Then uh, we move on to the 
last section of the exhibition, Mars in the Anthropocene. Uh, and here I would say this is where most of our contributions came uh, with uh, the contemporary artworks that we added in the exhibition. Um, Michael is here, he will talk about more about his work, but I will cover it uh, briefly and Venza as well. Uh, here we see um, Mars from uh, Luke Durham uh, with data that uh, have been collected from uh, spacecrafts that are observing Mars. Uh, this uh, artwork was uh, created, or we can say fabricated specifically for our exhibition uh, to fit uh, in uh, our galleries. And uh, we thought that this would be a great way to end the exhibition, to hang Mars uh, above us and remind all of us that we, uh, Mars is just over there uh, and we might be about to go to Mars. So let's see what's around uh, Luke Germ's Mars. First, uh, some stories from uh, Asia. We start in India with uh, Superflux's work uh, about the Indian uh, mission, that uh, a spacecraft that went to observe Mars. It was about 10 years ago. So they went to the streets of Hyderabad, handing out uh, trinkets, very cheap trinkets like you would find at the uh, at the street vendor, and they were handing this out to the people of Hyderabad, asking them questions of, uh, uh, that would be like, why is India spending that much money to study Mars? Why should we go and explore Mars? Uh, so this is a collection of uh, about 40 interviews, and it gives us a great perspective into what uh, people think uh, in, in a country like India that did not have a very long uh, space exploration uh, history. Then we moved to Indonesia, back to Venza. Uh, I'm sure he will tell us more about this later in his presentation. Uh, but Venza is very active in uh, Indonesia, trying to promote space education uh, and bring space a little bit closer to the people of Indonesia by both creating uh, the, his museum and also creating a Mars analog which is, you can imagine, something like a base camp where people can go and simulate life on Mars. Apart from that, uh, he's also involved in many activities, like, and his latest one is the production of a movie uh, that is being produced in Indonesia about life on Mars. Uh, so we're presenting all of these activities of his in his corner here, which I find uh, incredible that he is so passionate about uh, space and he wants to bring that to uh, the rest of the people in Indonesia. And uh, next up, we uh, come back to Singapore uh, with uh, space faculty and uh, uh, the Genome Institute of Singapore. Um, space faculty, uh, I, I'm sure we have a lot of uh, uh, people from space fa faculty here today. Uh, they um, uh, are based in Singapore and they promote, uh, again, space education uh, and uh, the promotion of uh, space technology, not only for space, but for the Earth as well. Um, in the showcase below, we are presenting an experiment uh, in collaboration with uh, the Genome Institute of Singapore uh, in which we have Earth soil and we have Mars simulant soil, which is soil that uh, has properties similar to what we find on Mars. Uh, and we are growing plants uh, at the moment in the galleries to compare how plants would grow uh, on Mars uh, with that soil. Uh, please make sure to go take a look. There's already, you can see the difference that the plants grow much better uh, in the earth soil. Um, so with that, I, I wanted, we wanted this part of the exhibition to uh, focus on uh, stories that are happening right now about space and about Mars in Singapore or in the region. And speaking about plants, uh, we have one more work uh, from uh, uh, artist Alexander Daisy Ginsburg called The Wilding of Mars. Um, Alexandra is saying, Daisy is saying that, okay, there's a lot of fascination with Mars and uh, we are uh, building the technology to go there. Maybe we want to uh, go and create a basis for humans to live there, but her proposal is that we don't go to Mars. Uh, her proposal is that we just send plants to Mars and we see them grow from a distance and we make uh, Mars a beautiful garden to admire. Uh, without us going there, and uh, if we go, who knows what happens. Um, it, and it was very interesting to have this discourse in the gallery, that not everybody is as enthusiastic or as 
uh, wanting to go to Mars uh, around the world. There are different opinions. Um, but speaking about uh, getting ready to go to Mars, uh, we have uh, this uh, series of uh, photographs from Austrian photographer uh, Florian Vogeneder, uh, who received training and participated in uh, a mission, another Mars analog that took place in the desert of Oman, and he recorded life there. Uh, so we have the Mars analog in Indonesia, we have another Mars analog uh, in uh, the desert of Oman, and at the moment there is one more uh, Mars analog active with four people and closed uh, in uh, one house, we could call it, uh, in the US. Uh, they will come out in a few months. Uh, so there is already this intense interest of simulating life on Mars and for us to get ready to, uh, so that we can expect every, all the issues that will arise there. Then I will speak about uh, Michael, who is here, and he will tell us more about his work in a moment. Uh, we have three works from Michael in the exhibition. Uh, the first one is uh, terraforming, uh, which uh, greatly uh, encapsulates the uh, meaning of the third section uh, and what Juan was saying earlier, that we are bad managers of planets and that the Earth might change to become more like Mars, more like a desert if we don't pay attention. Or that in the future we might need to terraform Mars to be able to live there. Um, then the other two works are linked to SpaceX, we could say, uh, with uh, a Starbase on the right and Starship on the left. Um, Michael has created uh, a future imagining of what the SpaceX um, star base is going to like in the future when there are more buildings there and when perhaps we are closer to getting to Mars. While uh, Starship uh, brings us back to reality uh, with footage uh, that he took uh, earlier this year in April or May uh, with the first launch of uh, the Starship at SpaceX which was uh, not successful and uh, uh, there was this dramatic footage of uh, the rocket uh, exploding. Um, but perhaps you have heard in the news that uh, they have already made progress and the second launch went much better. Finally, I have one more slide. Um, we, have, we were discussing with Juan for a long time about how we are going to incorporate AI into the exhibition. Perhaps a hint uh, to just for everybody to think about how, how AI might help us uh, on our journey to Mars. Uh, we found this artwork by the artist Nero Cosmos, uh, which is an AI-generated artwork called Marsonauts. Uh, Nero Cosmos fed the AI with images from Mars and images of uh, uh, astronauts, uh, and he has been generating um, a new Marsonaut every day, and he will keep doing that until the day we go to Mars. Um, we have the old ones in the exhibition and we can see which one is being created every day as well. Um, this takes me to the end of my presentation uh, and I hope I gave you a good overview of what the exhibition is about and what we try to do here at Art Science Museum. Um, but all th that was thanks to the incredible base that we received. Uh, the incredible uh, research that uh, was already there from uh, the CCCB that we were able to build upon uh, because we, ha we would have not been able to reach that new level of the exhibition if uh, the original was not there. So once again, Juan, Judith, everybody, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dimitris. Planets were regarded as mystical symbols and figures in the distant past, with Mars being represented as a god of war across history, going by different names in different cultures. Um, the first section of the exhibition, Mars in Ancient Cultures, illustrates this, the, these um, depictions and interpretations of Mars across civilizations with objects on loan from the Museum of Fine Arts of Lyon. And we're really delighted to have with us today the museum's chief curator, of the Department of Antiquities, Genevieve Galliano, who will share insights into the collection of historical artifacts showcased in the exhibition with the presentation. Genevieve, please. I would like to, I would like to begin 
by extending my our thanks to the Art Science Museum for inviting me and the Museum of Fine Arts of Lyon to participate in the exhibition Morse the Red Mirror. First, first, let me give you a brief introduction to our museum. It is located in the city center of Lyon and hosted in the magnificent 17th century monastery. The museum was officially created in 1801, just after the French Revolution by Napoleon Bonaparte. Its last complete renovation took place at the end of the 20th century. 20th century. The collections from ancient Egypt to modern art are divided into departments, antiquity, decorative art, coins and medals, painting, graphic art, and sculpture. We have lent to the exhibition Mars, the Red Mirror, two bronze figurines of the god Mars. One of them was produced in the pre-Roman Italy. The second one probably originated from Roman Gaul, ancient France. The origin and the time periods may be solely deduced from the style of the objects due to the fact we have no information on the original provenances. In our museum, a number of antiquities come from old private collections acquired or donated to the museum during the 19th century. These two figurines and many others belong to Jacques-Antoine Lambert, a wealthy draper merchant of Lyon. He was a great collector of ancient and Renaissance art. In 1850, he bequeathed to the city of Lyon more than 1,000 antiquities, Egyptian, Greek, Etruscan, Roman, work of Renaissance art, coins, medal, and books. He probably bought his collection in the art trade. The context of the discoveries, such as a shrine, a tomb, a votive deposit, were most often unknown and sometimes invented to increase the market value of the object. Lambert owned some of our representation of Mars among many of our bronze figurines of Etruscan and Roman deities, such as Mercury, Apollo, Venus, Minerva, Achilles. For example, this est this Etruscan skyny figurines of Mars style is indicative of a production of Volterra in Etruria in 6th or 5th century BC. The other figurine was produced in Italy or in Gaul at the beginning of the Roman period. The museum preserves many figurines that belonged to other art collections. Thanks to the recent discovery of a drawing album, we now know that these two figurines once belonged to a 18th century collector, Abbot Pichoni, a learned clergyman from Nîmes in south of France. Finally, I would like to draw your attention to this impressive full-scale statue of Mars. In 1897, um, a former found found about 400 fragments of bronze in his field near Lyon. These precious metal fragments were probably intended to be melted and re reused. The position of the reconstructive statue right at home, which could have held a spear, as well as the missing fragment on the top of the head, which likely wore a helmet, helped to identify the statue as a good morse. Currently, the, the statue is in deposit in the Archaeological Museum of Lyon. Through these examples, you may have not that the different types of moths. The god can be portrayed naked, or just a coat around the bust of the west, or wearing armor. He generally stands and wears a Greek crest almost. At first, during the Greek period, he had a beard, beard and later took on 
took on the appearance of a beardless young man. Usually, he held weapons, offensive, a spear, and defensive, a shield. This figurine made in Etruria. Etruria is here in Italy, in old Italy. Dated to the 4th, 3rd century BC, was manufactured using the technique of solid cast bronze. This means that the figurine was not alone. We can recognize Mars portrayed as a warrior in a combat posture. His weapons are, not, are now lost, but by the position on their arms, we are able to deduce that he held a shield on his left and a spear in the right hand. As usual, the god wears a Greek crest helmet, body armor, and leg protection. This type of character is sometimes, is, is sometimes difficult to precisely identify because of his attributes are the same for warrior figures, armor, helmet, weapons. However, in this case, due to the origin and period, we can be sure that is truly a representation of Mars or a local warrior God assimilated to Mars. This object is a Roman decorative element, possibly for, from furniture. It represents a bust of Mars emerging from, from a floral corolla. The god, portrayed as a young man, is recognizable with the Greek Corinthian crest helmet, and we can see the neckline of his armor. As you know, Roman mythology is a continuation of Greek mythology. Greek and Roman gods almost had the same powers. Their name was different. Mars, Ares for Greeks, was a son of the Olympian deities, Zeus, Jupiter, king of the gods, and Hera, Juno, goddess of marriage, woman, and childhood. Or, According to the Latin poet Ovid, the son of Juno alone, the goddess having been fertilized by, by a magic flower. Mars was the god of spirit of war. His festival took, took place at the end of winter when the armies resumed fighting, probably before being associating with war Mars was god of vegetation and spring renewal. While his cult was not prevalent in Greece, Mars was one of the main deities worshipped in Rome. Rome's policy from the Republic to the Empire of basing its domination on beliefs and customs of the subject territories in Italian peninsula, many Italic people venerated warrior gods for a long time. Under Roman regime, these local gods were gradually assimilated to Mars as the great Sabine god Quirinus, who became one of the oldest gods of the city of Rome. Mars fathered the founders of Rome, the twins Romulus and Remus. Their mother was a Vestal Rhea Silvia. Mars had several wives. The most famous of them was Aphrodite Venus, goddess of beauty and love. Mars appears from the beginning as the founding element of Rome. Through the promotion of the cult of the god of war, Rome justified power by arms on the subject territories and its military policy. Many sanctuaries dedicated to Mars existed in Italy and in other provinces of the empire. The most famous among them was the temple of Mars Ultor, built by Augustus, the first emperor, on his forum in Rome, 
Mons Ultra means Mons the Avenger, Avenger of his father, Julius Caesar's murderers. In various other places within the Roman Empire, archaeologists have found remains of most places of worship. I have chosen two examples in France. The Greek sanctuary of Mars Mulo in the west of France, built above a Celtic sanctuary at the end of the first century AD on the plants of a Roman temple. The name Mulo could mean mound, possibly referring to war booty and weapons picked up after a military victory. The second example is a sanctuary recently excavated in Brittany. It is this one. No, sorry. Uh, in this case, without dedicatory de inscription, the identification of the god is based on the discovery of figurines of moss and deposit of weapons. There is no doubt that moss was one, one, was one of the most venerated Roman ghosts at the Roman period. I am not qualified to talk about the planet Mars at the Roman time. I have, I have read that Greek astronomers called the planet Pyroeus Mars, Eris Mars, because of its color red, which invoked blood on the battlefields. However, I am sure that many of you can deduce for yourself whether or not this is true. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Genevieve. Our next talk in the program continues to explore Mars and the human imagination. Um, by the end of the 20th century, Mars had become a deep-seated influence um, for the science fiction genre. And while a dedicated cinema within the exhibition is screening films and documentation about the red planet, we also conceive the In Search of Tomorrow science, science fiction season that accompanies the exhibition during its run. An assistant curator of public programs, Rachel Wong, um, is here today, and she will lean into the film team's research for the companion film program and illustrate sci-fi's enduring love affair with the Red Planet. Over to you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sid, for inviting me to share today. It's been wonderful listening to all the speakers, Juan, Dimitri, and Genevieve sharing. Uh, I'm excited, a little nervous, to be sharing alongside such great speakers. My name is Rachel, and I'm the Assistant Curator of Public Programs at ArtScience Museum, and part of the Film and Moving Image team here. So today, I will be sharing on how we came to develop the film program called In Search of Tomorrow, that is part of the mega sci-fi season we have at the museum this end of year, which of course includes the Mars exhibition, um, as well as the show that we have on Level 3, New Eden, Science Fiction Mythologies Transformed, and the whole host of programs that we have around these exhibitions. Science fiction is such a rich and beloved genre. There are so many different facets and themes, renowned films and directors. It was a bit of an intimidating task of what we put in and what we risk leaving out. There were multiple directions that we could go and each one seemed important. So today I'll be talking a little bit about how we use the ongoing exhibitions as a starting point in thinking about the film program but also using this opportunity to expand on certain themes and how we ended up highlighting stories that redefine the genre, and at the heart of it, convey ideas that reveal our hopes and fears for tomorrow's world. So before I speak more about the film program and how we shaped the lineup and the stories that we wanted to focus on, I just wanted to give a really quick background about the cinema and VR spaces we have at the museum, uh, which are relatively new. So we opened the VR gallery in 2021, and the cinema was revamped just last year, where we added these new plush seats that you guys are sitting on, um, and wireless headphones for the film screenings. And apart from showing films that are tied with the ongoing exhibitions, we also try to show films or figures in cinema that celebrate experimentation, were pioneering or cutting edge in their field, 
whether it's through feature or short films or dedicated retrospectives. And I just wanted to leave these photos here uh, because in hindsight, the design of these spaces have a little sci-fi flair to them uh, with the red colors and the pot seats in the VR gallery, which we envisioned would cocoon you as you are launched into an immersive virtual reality environment. So I think we might have always had a little bit of sci-fi inspiration while building these spaces. And of course, being the Art Science Museum, it's not our first time exploring the genre. Back in 2021, the cinema and VR gallery had a season of space-themed films and VR artworks. And the VR work was a particular hit. Called Space Walkers, it looked at the past and future of space travel, retracing the footsteps of the first humans on the moon, and thereafter, imagining the first human on Mars. And people really loved this work. And I think with this season, we saw that there was a huge appetite for space-related, sci-fi type of experiences. And so this year, with the launch of exhibitions that focused on science fiction in different ways, it would be remiss not to celebrate the season with a dedicated film program to reflect this intersection of cinema and sci-fi. There's such a rich cinematic history of the genre that we can trace all the way back from the silent film of the 20s, the golden era of B-movies in the 50s, to modern day blockbusters, and also more contemporary, reflective, sometimes art house films, that redefine sci-fi cinema. Uh, myself and Jerome, who is the other curator on the team, we were discussing for a long time on what we wanted to show in this program, and we eventually narrowed down our focus to these key points. So firstly, the fear and curiosity of the unknown and the desire to peek behind the curtain. And secondly, visions of the future and how that has been interpreted in cinema. So these were kind of our main guiding principles as we were looking at our very long list of films we acknowledged that there were a lot of science fiction films out there and sci-fi cinema programs. So for example, the BFI in London, they did a big season in recent years. So having those guiding principles were useful for us to check against. But another thing that worked to our advantage was tying it back to the exhibitions and expanding on some of the themes from there. We wanted to celebrate the genre with you know, the Tarkovskys, the Kubricks, these iconic space epics that push the boundaries of filmmaking but we also wanted to spotlight some of the Asian stories that blurred the lines between magical realism and sci-fi and adopted a more spiritual approach. And these are also themes that are similarly explored in New Eden, you know, the ideas of sci-fi's possible roots in Asian philosophy and mythologies. And finally, with Mars, with our film selection, we wanted to chart the evolution and trends of depictions of Mars on films, uh, from the silly to the serious, um, which I'll focus on today. So this is just a quick snapshot of the three kind of moments in sci-fi cinema that we wanted to highlight in the program. So firstly, films by Asian filmmakers who redefine the genre. So of course, we had to include a film by Api Chapong, who creates these dreamlike, disquieting worlds which are difficult to put in words and really best experience. Um, this particular film memoria stars uh, Tilda Swinton, who I think if we had to do another sci-fi program, uh, could just be a retrospective on her work. Uh, she plays a woman who becomes haunted by a recurring sound that no one else can hear. And I think what's interesting about the Asian titles that we have in the lineup is the way the sci-fi elements are implied or evoked by atmospheric imagery. It's often unexplained and it crosses into mysticism. I think it's a really understated approach which breathes new life in the genre. And then another theme that we were excited to explore was Japanese cyberpunk. So this one here is a film by one of the pioneers in the move movement, Kakuryu Ishii, about two guys with an electricity superpower getting into an epic showdown on the Tokyo rooftop. So it's wacky and absurd and completely original. And the aesthetics and themes of Japanese cyberpunk were of course hugely influential in Hollywood sci-fi like The Matrix. And finally, for our Mars segment, we are super pleased to show Mars Express, which is a French animated film released this year. It made its debut in Cannes Film Festival to rave reviews, and it's described as a visual blend between Blade Runner, Ghost in the Shell, and 2001 The Space Odyssey. So as you can see, it's really quite a diverse lineup. But today, to celebrate the opening of Mars, The Red Mirror, I want to talk a little bit about the films about Mars we have in the program, and why we included them following the fun bits of research we came across. So broadly, these are the Mars titles that we are showing in the program. So first off, we have the documentary Educational Angle with selected episodes from the original 1980s series Cosmos, A Personal Voyage. And we have Devil Girl from Mars, a Camp B movie from 1954 about a female Martian invader. 
Uh, we are also showing probably one of the most successful Mars films of all time, The Martian, starring Matt Damon as a lone astronaut who tries to survive on Mars. And lastly, Mars Express, which I shared earlier. So we wanted to start from when depictions of Mars in film was completely imaginative and out of this world. I think we had a lot of fun um, looking at all these old trailers and posters of 50s and 60s movies where the taglines were always very catchy and tongue-in-cheek and playing up a bit of the pseudoscience. So lines like, you know, it's fantastic but possible, it could happen tomorrow, or my favorite, truly a science fact story, um, show the kind of optimism and thrilling discoveries of Mars as the likeliest place of extraterrestrial life, I think really encapsulated the Mars fever of that time. And it's, kind of, it's a kind of language that you don't really see anymore and really embodies a specific part in cinema history. So this is a trailer clip from Devil Go from Mars. Um, it's spelled again, you know, with the same tongue in cheek language. And you can see the So as the title suggests, uh, Devil Girl from Mars is about an invader from Mars, specifically a female Martian, who comes to Earth looking for men to bring back to her home planet for breeding purposes. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the kind of film that will still happen now. <laughs> um, but situating this film in the 50s during the post-war period, uh, when there was also a fear of nuclear weapons and threats against humanity, so invasion was a common theme. So having this film in the lineup for us was showing the start of the attitudes and beliefs towards Mars in popular culture, which of course were driven by whatever else was happening in the world. And this particular film was infamous for a number of reasons. Uh, it was made on a low budget. Most of them were stage actors. So uh, when you watch the film, the blocking is really weird. It's more like a stage play than a film. And it inspired sci-fi author Octavia E. Butler to begin writing science fiction but not exactly for the best reason, um, as she declared that she could write something better after watching this at 12 years old. But besides all of that, <laughs> um, I think it's a really fun can be movie. Uh, and mainly, I just really love the costume. I mean, the black leather miniskirt, the boots. Uh, it's an alien fashion that I think is coming back in trend again. So we move to the 80s with Cosmos, and this gap between the years is not unintentional. From the 60s onwards, there's kind of a decline in Mars on film um, because of scientific discoveries that there is, in fact, no intelligent aliens on the planet. NASA missions like the Viking space probes reveal that Mars is a cold, desolate planet with no traces of life. And up to this point, this was the history and development of Mars that Carl Sagan explains in his television series, Cosmos. So Cosmos was created in 1980 together with his wife, Andrew Ryan. And the series covered scientific subjects in such an accessible way that it's considered one of the most important TV programs in history. So I won't talk too much about Carl Sagan, but his impact on science education and ability to reach mass audiences was truly inspiring. And watching this particular episode, Blues for a Red Planet, is also incredibly prescient. At the end of the episode, he talks about the possibility of a human mission to Mars and how the focus would shift towards possibly terraforming and colonizing Mars. So, sounds familiar? Um, and further from that, the special effects were groundbreaking for that time, and it really doesn't feel like you're watching a documentary. Uh, as my colleague Jerome puts it, Cosmos is a documentary as art house poetry. So do catch this at the cinema as we're screening it every day on the weekdays from next week. Uh, and fast forwarding to the 2000s, um, after a series of Mars related film flops like John Carter and Red Planet, the streak was finally broken with The Martian in 2015. It was one of the highest grossing films of 2015 and nominated for seven awards at the Oscars. And I think from the start, the film had a lot going for it. Um, it had big names attached to it, like director Ridley Scott, you know, who's famous for Alien and Blade Runner. And it starred Matt Damon, who you know, is a Hollywood familiar face. But the biggest draw for the film was how the story was committed to real science. NASA was heavily involved in the film's production as it saw the potential in promoting space exploration, providing heavy consultation like sending real images of Mars and control centers right down to what the computer screens look like. And the marketing for The Martian was unprecedented. For one, the preview was screened in the most remote place in the universe, aboard the International Space Station. It was movie night for the astronauts. And four days before the film's release, NASA announced findings of liquid salt water on the surface of Mars, which is as good as a PR move for a sci-fi film that you can get. 
And you know, at the end of the day, it is a movie, and there's obviously going to be a lot of fictional elements. So there's a lot of spirited debate online about the scientific accuracies and inaccuracies. But I think to me, this is exciting because it shows exactly the impact of film into real life and everyday conversations about mass explorations. And as we move towards that very real possibility, this trickles down to film and popular culture. And I think what the Martian did was reignite this optimism again uh, by taking out the fantastical alien narratives and conversely bringing the story down back to Earth. So what's next for Mars in film? Um, another title that we're screening is Mars Express, an animated sci-fi thriller that is set in Mars, following a private detective and her android partner who try to uncover secrets about a robot uprising. It's a film that combines all the hot topics now, you know, Martian colonization, robots, AI, questioning humanity. And again, this future Mars looks more like a city that we know, a familiar world that is just a little more stylish with advanced technology. But what's great about animation is that it engenders the kind of imaginative spirit from the 50s and early 60s, not in the storylines, but how world building can be as complex and intricate as the medium allows. So I kind of see something, a full circle moment coming back here again. Um, and as for me, as the world becomes more diverse and progressive, I think we'll see even more complex female characters on screen. So this is an ode to the female Martians in cinema, the subversive, weird, overtly feminine aliens that turn gender and sci-fi, a traditionally male-dominated genre, on its head. So before I end this presentation, I would like to share the trailer of our film program, uh, edited by Eric Lee, which we are really proud of. So enjoy. If you didn't have an ounce of adventuresome spirit in you, it would still make sense to support the exploration of Mars. It's great dust storms and the resulting cooling of its surface played a role in the discovery of nuclear winter predicted to follow nuclear war. The key issue in my mind is whether the unmet needs down here on Earth should take priority. But that's a question even more appropriately addressed to the military budgets. Now, one trillion dollars a year. Screening Devil Girl from Mars tonight. Uh, we're extending free admission to anyone who has attended the symposium. So do keep your sticker and our front of house will be happy to let you in later. Uh, the film program runs till Jan next year and you can scan the QR code to find out more if you're interested. Uh, aside from the screenings, we also have other related programs in the museum. So do check it out on the website. And that's the end of my presentation. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, thank you, Rachel. We're just going to get Rachel to take a seat on stage and invite um, Juan and Genevieve and Dimitris back on stage to join Rachel for Q&A. And um, it's my delight to welcome one of the lovely curatorial voices behind the exhibition as well, my colleague Chelsea Chai, um, who is assistant curator of exhibitions at Art Science Museum, and she'll be moderating the panel and taking questions from all of you. Um, Chelsea, I'm handing the time over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sin, and thank you all of you uh, here for giving up some of your mm -hmm. Saturday afternoon to be here with us for the opening symposium. So hello everyone, I'm Chelsea Chai. I work alongside Juan Insua and also my amazing colleagues, um, Dimitri and Joshua, for this uh, presentation of Master Red Mirror at Art Science Museum. So um, I'm totally pleased today uh, to be with you on the first panel uh, of discussion. And all right, today we are very excited to have um, with us a wonderful panel, um, a warm welcome again to all our distinguished speakers over here on stage. Uh, now, without further ado, uh, let's dive into the heart of the discussion, which revolves around the fascinating exhibition, Mars the Red Mirror. I think everyone here must have been very curious to uh, know more about Mars being the subject, the core subject of this exhibition. With this, I would like to ask the first question to our curator here, Juan Insua, um, to tell us more, if you could quickly share with us more about what inspired you to explore Mars 
in this unique way or manner, like how Mars the Red Mirror did? Juan, please. Um, well, uh, I always, uh, I was uh, always, uh, my, my um, I have a, a heterodox vision in general of all the world, all cultures, and science fiction for me was um, very important. And um, it was the, the, the idea of explore planet, uh, I, re I remember my childhood in Argentina when I was uh, seven year old. And in that moment, there is no light contamination. And the sky was very high. And uh, I live in a town with my family. And I look to the universe, and is the first great impression and was uh, a terrible emotion, but it, what happened here? What happened realmente here? I live here with my family. This is Argentina, it's a little town. But what, what is this? No? And then this um, a terrible, impressive emotion about some distance, about all happened in Earth. And then uh, I remember when I um, study English in before six and 12 years, uh, my um, uh, professor helped me to write uh, a letter to uh, NASA. <laughs> yes, in, in the, well, yes, in the 60s. And I wrote a letter about, because in that moment, the other thing, I want to be an alchemist. I, <laughs> I want to be a writer. I want to be an astronaut, too. Yeah. And then uh, the NASA sent me uh, a lot of photographs. I remember I lost them. And uh, I think in all this now, because we're talking about what the origin of that kind of emotion is that we live in Earth, but we are part of an um, extraordinary universe. And that sensation I never recover because in the Pyrenees in Spain, when you have in summer, it's possible to have sunlight, but uh, it's, but this, um, it's, uh, I remember now this sensation when you asked me. And I don't know if I answer <laughs> your question, mm -hmm. but this one, one um, um, the ground, the background mm -hmm. about my, then I read a lot of things. And I, I read really um, Julio Verne between s seven years and, and, uh, and well, Poe, etc. No? Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, this is one my background about uh, and and the other thing is um, I always been in interested in when I have ten years or twelve years I read a book of uh, Alexander Barzavsky that is uh, Argentinian astronomer uh, that he really says that that is uh, the rational is to think that the the all universe is full of life and the irrational thing, we are alone. Well, it's very interesting to hear from you that you have come across the topic of space or even with NASA when you were a kid. I mean, not a lot of people have dreamt that we, we could have written a letter to NASA that easily. But thank you so much for sharing with us, Juan. That was very insightful to hear from you. Um, now I will open the floor for more questions. So if you have any questions, you can raise your hands. My colleague at the back will pass the mic over to you. Hi, thank you. Thank you for sharing your insights. Um, like two quick questions, um, like one more serious one, one I think more interesting one. Sure. Um, like let's based on like your educated guess, which specific year you think you set foot 
on Mars, the first human, like if, um, so that I can note down and see who's the closest. And the other the one is, um, if let's say you were the first human to set foot on Mars, you know, what would you say uh, back to all of us on Earth? Thank you. Wow, one serious and one not serious. <laughs> Okay, I'll pass the serious one to probably Juan, <laughs> who is the most knowledgeable one about okay, I, I, the planet I, I Mars. The, 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 <laughs> the first human that set foot on Mars. The year. Ah, what yeah. year? Uh, or, well, I, I think, uh, I, I really think that the, the, the real knowledge about that is, is, is about um, um, Michael. <laughs> Can <laughs> have more more information about that because he visits the SpaceX and that. I'm I'm really think that we go to Mars um, if between 30, 40, 50. But we go, we go to Mars. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the it's not don't stop. We don't stop. We have uh, the Uberis to go. If we can do, we do. Mm. <laughs> Oh, and the then um, yes, the, the, the nec in the next decade, uh, but it, so it, it depends of, of the collapse of, mm -hmm. of the planet Earth. It's possible that uh, in the other side go uh, Elon and his family to Mars, and we are alone here dying. So you feel that the uh, human exploration to Mars is never ending, right? Yes. In a way. Yes. Okay, I'll pass the second question probably to our fun loving colleague here, Dimitri. <laughs> Okay, the second question is actually very difficult. <laughs> um, for the first one, I would also say around 40 years. Yeah. But for the first one, like I think that uh, the astronauts that went to the moon, they had probably months of media preparation to prepare this uh, answer to this question. The first thing that comes to mind is perhaps something along the lines that uh, we are one humankind. Mm -hmm. um, if we make it to Mars and if we can survive on Mars, uh, if we are not unified in one, we will not make it. I was watching uh, The Expanse after Honor uh, suggested it to me on Netflix, uh, which is about uh, Mars colonization. And it seemed, I'm not sure how many of you have watched it, but uh, there were so many weapons and bullets and guns and fighting uh, on Mars and in the other parts of the solar system that we had occupied. Uh, and it just seemed so incredibly unrealistic to me that uh, there was so much fighting, and at the same time, people could survive on Mars while fighting. Impossible. Uh, if we don't put this behind us, we will never make it alive on Mars. So, yeah, uh, let's change our minds first and be unified on Mars. Very well answered, Dimitri. <laughs> Do we have any more questions coming from the floor? Oh, there's one to the left here. Thanks for the very insightful sharing. This question is directed to Rachel. Um, I noticed that you put up a lot of films, that, uh, especially the more recent ones that have contributions from scientists and astronauts uh, that have really impacted the, the sci-fi genre and, and, and filmmaking. I'm wondering if, from your perspective, based on the research you've done, is this trend here to stay? And um, uh, what, what are the consequences or the impacts that this has had for, for film and for, and for engagement of the public for this genre that you have looked at? Wow, okay. Um, I, yes, I do think that the trend is that there will be more scientists and people in scientific field who would contribute to the field of cinema because I think, uh, I think cinema and the moving image uh, is kind of like the currency now, um, especially with streaming sites like Netflix and Disney Plus. There's just more and more people who are into cinema and watching films. So I think. But not just like scientists, I feel like it's just across the board, like people working in literature or other kinds of art forms or yeah, just other types of fields as well. So I, I don't think it's limited to that, but I think it's exciting if, you know, more films can be uh, based on like scientific facts or like in close consultation with NASA. So for example, The Martian, I think there's a reason why it became so big and there's a reason why so many people resonated with it because they really saw the real possibilities that this could happen. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> All right. I actually have a question for Genevieve next to me, sitting here. 
So bring back to the core heart of um, the exhibition itself. You know, we were able to mine the past with historical objects uh, from the Museum of the Fine Arts in Lyon and uh, we cast them in the context of a contemporary exhibition like Mars the Red Mirror. So I wanted to ask you, were there any perspectives that had come about to you um, through this approach? If you could kindly share with us. <laughs> yes. Um, I am an archaeologist. Generally, I look at the past and not uh, to the future. <laughs> but uh, it was a very good experience to, to work with you for the exhibition. And uh, maybe from the perspective, could be to include uh, contemporary art to, me, to my exhibition of uh, history of archaeology. And uh, maybe to, I think to that for <laughs> some days, I'm thinking to that, um, to organize an exhibition on the Roman deities in relationship with the planets, not only Mars, but many of them, Mercury, and uh, to, um, to, to do a link from the antiquity to, to now. It could be a, an idea. Thank you so much. Do we have any more questions coming from the floor? Just one in the middle. Um, I have two questions. Sure. I have one question that I was interested to ask, and I have another question that was just a curious question. Okay, go ahead. My first question is, why choose Mars over other planets like the Moon, as the Moon is nearer? Why choose Mars specifically for human exploration? Okay, that's a very interesting question, actually. I'll pass that to Juan. Why Mars over all other planets? Uh, <laughs> there's Moon, which is quite near to Earth, but why Mars over other planets for human exploration? Do you think you have any um, insights to this? Okay, uh, let, me, let me simplify this question. Um, there are many planets, yeah. But why Mars? Yeah. For human exploration, yeah. Well, uh, I think uh, I'm from the <laughs> patriarchal tradition. <laughs> no, uh, no. The, the the moon is is another object really mm. important. Mm. Uh, the question is that we know all about moon mm. and. Uh, because I think the real um, geostrategical objective of the new space race mm. between fundamental Chinese and, and American uh, is the first with the companies or the countries that came to Mars. Mm. Yeah. I, I think all, all this first part of the new space economy that is the cis lunar economy is all the traffic that is in the next year we have to the moon mm. Huh? Mm. it's all the companies virgin etc have to the moon is a lot of uh, and w what happened in the moon is is a basis to take the jump for 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 mars and, and mars is uh, a different of the moon there is um, well, the um, the muse or a, a central object of science fiction, and it's perfect to the the two parts, science and fiction. And usually, that uh, become uh, that was fiction becomes science, and the science fit the the the, um, the fiction because, for example, the trilogy of Kim Stanley Robinson. It's not possible without the knowledge uh, of the formation of Mars and the, in, in the 90. And I think is is um, and, and Mar uh, Mars do have uh, another kind of uh, in the um, in the sense of our um, stratus of consciousness that is a is a. Um, a very interesting uh, approximation of Carl Gustav Jung, Jung that he said that uh, Mars, in the, when he studied alchemy, was one of the, the principal force in the process of what a spiritual process 
and he was uh, uh, essential for life in, in the sense of archetypical project or, or question. It's more uh, richness or what happened with Mars and the reinterpretation of Mars. Yeah? I think everything that you have shared with us really sits well with the concepts of the exhibition also. So when you have time, you can head down to our exhibition downstairs and you can uh, you can take a look at all the different kind of content we have and uh, the kind of vast knowledge that Juan has shared with us as well. So um, for now, I just have a final question to ask all of you on our panel. Um, is there a section in the exhibition that resonates with you or hold a certain special meaning for you? Maybe we can start with Genevieve. Uh, of course, I, am, I was interested in the first part of the past but um, the, the hand with all the video in inclusive, uh, yes, was very um, strong. Special for, Special you, for yeah. me, yes. yes. Okay. How about Juan? Well, I, I can talk about what we do, <laughs> but <laughs> it's not elegance. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, um, uh, the work of, of uh, the museum, mm -hmm. the new part of the Asian cultures, and the artists that they include, uh, for me, are re really now, uh, because I, I can talk about, oh, well, all the audiovisuals are the better, or I want this, I want that. Uh, but I, I, I think uh, the work of um, this museum was great, because uh, it, it's a better version in the sense that it's a more complex Thank you. Uh, vision of, of Mars. We have more uh, an European or Eurocentric vision, and we com you complete with the Asian vision and uh, the, 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 the artist that you include. Thank you. How about you, Dimitri? Actually, I'm going to continue what Juan was saying, which was uh, what I liked most about the exhibition. As I said in the beginning of my presentation, I am Greek, I studied astronomy, mm -hmm. so I was coming into the exhibition with perhaps some kind of bias as to what is common knowledge about Mars or about space uh, or about certain terminology. Uh, and uh, while working uh, with you and the rest of the team, I realized that my bias was very, um, coming from a European point of view or from a Greek point of view or from somebody who had studied astronomy. So working together uh, made me realize that people around the world have uh, are seeing Mars in, or astronomy in a different perspective. And I think that with uh, the work that we did, our visitors will be, be able to get the full picture. That's what I really enjoy. Thank you. Last but not least, let's hear from Rachel. Uh, it's hard to follow up from that because I'm going <laughs> to give a really <laughs> shallow answer. But I think it's a bit of a cop-out for me to say that the second section is my favorite. But it really is. I think popular science fiction is always super fun to like look through and watch. And I'm personally a big fan of Sailor Moon. Uh, I grew up watching the anime. So I think when Dimitris and Chelsea and Joshua, when they first presented that, you know, they might be presenting the Sailor Moon manga, I was like, yes, yes, you have to. <laughs> so yeah, I think the second section for me was really special. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your insightful responses. Um, so a heartful thank you once again to each of our panelists for a very wonderful discussion. I think everything you've shared has left um, many thoughts for our audience and me myself as well. Um, now I would like to hand over back the time to Sin, uh, who will help to close off the panel discussion. Sin, please. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for moderating the first panel. And also our speakers, Genevieve, Juan, Dimitris, and Rachel. Um, and for responding to all the questions from the floor, we're taking a very, very quick break, and we're coming back in about 15 minutes or so. Um, it will kick off with a presentation from um, Dr. Masaki Hujimoto on Japan's Martian Moons Exploration Mission, and be followed by um, a dynamic lineup of presentations from artists Michael Naja. Um, we have Vincent Christ here today, and we have scientists Dr. Roy Ang um, and space faculty Lynette Tan. Um, we will see you back for the second half of the program at 4 p.m. Please have a good break. <laughs>